My mind leads me to speak now, of forms changed into new bodies. O oh, gods above, inspire this undertaking, which you've changed as well, and guide my poem in its epic sweep, from the world's beginning to the present day. Ovid golden. That first age, which, though ignorant of laws, yet of its own will, uncoerced, fostered responsibility and virtue. As of yet, no pine tree on its mountain top had been chopped down and fitted to a ship, men kept to their own shores. There were no straight bronze trumpets, no curved horns, no swords or helmets. Without warfare, all the nations lived securely indolent. Spring was the only season that there was, and the warm breath of gentle zephyr stroked the flowers that sprang up from the ground, unsown. Later, though still untilled, the earth bore grain, and fields, unfallowed, whitened with their wheat, now streams of milk, now streams of nectar flowed, and from the green oak, golden honey dripped. When Saturn was dispatched to Tartarus, Jove ruled the world, and the silver race appeared. Less dear than gold, but costlier than bronze. Jupiter made the ancient springtime shorter by adding on to it three seasons more. Now winter, summer, and erratic fall, and a brief spring filled out the fourfold year. The third age followed with a race of bronze, crueler by nature, and much more disposed to savage warfare, but not yet corrupt. Last was the Age of Iron. Suddenly, all forms of evil burst out this time, of baser metal, modesty, fidelity, and truth departed. In their absence came fraud, guile, deceit, and the use of violence, and shameful things, lusting after acquisition. Now arms are grasped in blood-stained hands, men live off plunder, and the guest has no protection from his host, nor father-in-law from his daughter's husband, and kindness between brothers is infrequent. Husband and wife both wish each other dead, and wicked stepmothers conceit the vilest poisons that turn their youthful victims pale. Piety leaves vanquished here below. Virgin Astera, the last immortal left on the blood-stained earth, withdraws from it in horror. Man had fallen from the golden age into the iron, man had fallen. The gods were no longer revered. Indeed, they were not acknowledged. In hopes of discovering good among the world, Jove went down to test the people. What he found confirmed his worst fears. And I walked upon the earth. Long it would take to enumerate the evils I found. By signs, I let them know a god had come, and the common folk began to offer prayers. At first, Lycanon mocked their piety, and then he said, I will make a trial of him, and prove beyond a shadow of doubt whether this fellow is god or man. He took him hostage, sent by the Mausoleans, and after severing his windpipe, cut his body in pieces, and put up the throbbing parts to be boiled or broiled. As soon as he had set this on the table, I loosed my vengeful bolts, 
Frightened, he runs off into the silent fields and howls aloud, attempting speech in vain. His garments are now a shaggy pelt, his arms turn into legs, and he... to a wolf. Man has failed. Man has failed, and now he must be punished. But the gods cannot burn the earth. For if the earth is burned, so will Olympus burn. Therefore, the world must be purified by water. There are no longer boundaries between the earth and the sea. For everything is the sea. And the sea is everywhere, without a shore. One takes to the hills, another to his skiff, rowing where he once plowed the earth in rows, while yet another sails above his grain fields, or glimpses far below his sunken villa. And here in the topmost branches of an elm is someone casting out a fishing line. An anchor grazes in a meadow's grass, or a curved keel sweeps beyond the vineyard. And the seal's misshapen figure lies at rest where the slender goats were lately fond of browsing. While dolphins take possession of the woods and shake the lofty branches of the oak as they brush by, the wolf swims among the sheep and the tawny lion and tiger both are carried helplessly upon the waves. The boar's great power, like a lightning bolt, does not avail, nor do the stag's swift limbs. After his long search for the landing place, the bird with weary wings collapses seaward. Unrestrained, the sea conceals the hills, and strange new waves beat at the mountain tops, and the greater part are drowned beneath the waves. While those spared drowning, perish of starvation. 